Today, answers matter more than ever before. That's why IBM is helping businesses manage customer questions with Watson Assistant. It's conversational AI designed to work for any industry. Let's put smart to work. Visit ibm.com slash Watson Assistant. Empire. Hello and welcome to yet another World is Ending podcast sponsored by Lono Coffee. Visit lonocoffee.com, use promo code COFFEE2020 for a discount. Good cup of joe might help you right about now. And by Dizzy Pig Barbecue, visit dizzypigbarbecue.com, use coupon KIND15, it's K-E-I-N-15 for 15% off your order, shipped in the U.S. It's worth it, folks. Today, I'm joined by the voice of the Washington football team, Bram Weinstein, to rehash the 2019 loss to the New York Giants. The bulk of our conversation focuses on Ron Revere's decision to go for two at the end of the game. Don't forget you can read my work on ESPN.com. You can follow Bram on Twitter at RealBramW. Before I play my conversation with Bram, here are a few of my thoughts. I completely understand what Ron Revere is saying, that he came here to win, that he's trying to build a winning mentality here. I think him going for it on fourth down twice proved that point once more. If fans embrace the riverboat Ron mentality in those situations, it's hard to then kind of say, yeah, but I wouldn't have done it here. When you commit to playing a certain way, that's what you become. That said, I would have kicked the extra point. My thinking is this, they had control of the game. And while that might be the reason to also go for two, I don't know that they have that kind of an offense where you can have that level of confidence in them uh, in this game. I think it was more of a reason to get into overtime and go win it there. Their defense was playing well enough to win at that point. Certainly, Daniel Jones was doing almost nothing through the air. Of their 100 of the Giants 132 yards rushing, 49 came on one of his runs. The Giants had one good drive in the second half. It ended with an interception. Washington had three good drives. It's just that one or one was becoming a good drive, but it ended up in a sack fumble return for a touchdown. Kind of killed the momentum of that drive. The point is, they were they were in control at that point. Had they kicked and went to overtime, I don't think anyone is saying a whole lot. This was a winless team that has a penchant for losing games late. It's hard to see that the Giants were gonna would be an would be that tough of a um, an out in overtime. If that was the Ravens, if it was the Rams, I certainly get it. I think in this case, you know, I probably would have taken my chance with getting there. Um, and who knows, there still was about 36 seconds left. The Giants had timeouts. Maybe they drive down and kick a field goal and, and, and win anyways in regulation. Maybe they try to do that and Daniel Jones throws a pick. Who knows? But again, that's, that's my preference. I know Rivera's got his point. He wants to, he's trying to build a certain mentality. I get that. I just would have gone the opposite route. I wonder if going for two has some bigger picture implications down the road. That's something we don't know how it pays off at that point because we can't tell now. I asked Kyle Allen about that after the game, and his comment was at the end of this year, they don't look back on this game and say, hey, they went for two. They'll just say, hey, it's an L. I talked to another former player after the game who pretty much said the same thing. Um, wasn't crazy about them going for two either. But does, it, does a mentality develop? Do players buy into that, or will they be frustrated? I don't know, but I don't think Rivera is going to change the way he operates. Listen, it worked for him in Carolina. Why would he change? There has been some definite mis- mixed messaging, or at least a shifting of the message during his time here that has led to confusion, whether by fans, media, whomever. I don't know that the players are that confused because we're not in the locker room talking to them and getting some of those conversations. I don't think it's, I don't, I don't get the sense that they're as confused as maybe fans are or media at times. I know many of you are getting worn out by it. I know there have been some there who have talked to him about it. Bram and I will discuss all this in a few minutes. But what we've seen is that is that he will stick to his belief in the standard he wants set and with how he's going to operate during games. It's why Dwayne Haskins is out and why I don't think he'll return unless they see what they want from him during the week. I'm not going to say much on Haskins since, well, he's, he didn't play. And some of you don't, I'm not sure that you really want to listen why he's not in there or have a harder time accepting it. I think part of that is because you what you want him to become And also what you also see in there, knowing that nobody, that Kyle Allen does not appear to be the future. Everybody I talked to over there the last two years says the same damn thing. Every person, approach wins, not talent. Combine both. You have a pro bowler, 
But so much of what happens still indirectly is tied to Haskins because Kyle Allen's play will always lead back to discussions on who should be in there or why isn't Haskins in there instead. The, the fans are having that discussion. I don't think the players are, I don't, and I know the coaches aren't, and I don't think others in that organization are having that discussion. I, my understanding is that no players went to Rivera after that change. Um, anyway, sidetrack there. I don't want to go down that road. I think what we're probably going to see from Allen is that he can be a good backup. Clearly, Washington felt this too because it started Haskins this season. They wanted him to be the guy. He didn't show what they wanted to see from someone whom they wanted to be a longtime starter. Allen will do a lot of those things. And in fairness to him, he's also young and he hasn't started a whole lot. If Haskins can learn, so can Allen. But the turnovers have always been a problem with him. I think that's clearly going to hold him back. That's what we saw from today. Was and Actually, let me take that back. What we saw from him today was this. He can extend plays. Is every extended play a good one? Well, of course not. But he does have that ability, and it came in handy on multiple plays. Picked up a crucial third down because of his ability to do so. On the fourth down and four, that ability helped as well. Couldn't tell in the two-point conversion if anything was there, but he was able to extend it. Bad results, but he, does, he can buy time. A less mobile quarterback would have been sacked in that situation. You need mobility at that position in this league unless you're a dynamic pocket passer. But Allen also fails to protect the ball, hence the sack fumble. He did what his coaches say he has a tendency to do on his interceptions, force the throw. It's funny because there were a few times he did a good job just by throwing the ball away. Sometimes the negative flares up and it becomes costly. On the pick, James Bradbury did an excellent job in coverage dropping off, but still, even if he's not dropping off, that ball is a bit forced. Missed some open targets as well. He also dropped a dime to Logan Thomas in the end zone and led the team on what we thought was a game-tying drive after the sack fumble. He came back strong after his interception. He came back strong after his fumble. I love the attitude and the mindset he has, but he's, the view of him is that he's a limited quarterback who makes mistakes with a limited cast of weapons around him. There's a definite yin and a yang with Allen. It felt like today, just when you fell in love, he ripped your heart out. And just when you cast him aside... He come, he came back, or, or he brought them back. So that's that's what you have in him. Can he get better? I don't know. But I like I said, he's young. I'm not going to tell you that he's going that he can be the guy now after after this game. I'm, I'm not going to tell you that. Um, but and I'm not going to tell you that I think he can be the quarterback of the future. I think the quarterback of the future is either in college or on another roster right now. But this is what Allen does, and it's, I do think a lot of what you saw today is why they do like him. The offense did move more consistently with him today. Um, we'll see where it goes. Bram and I talk about the run game a little bit, but one guy that has not helped at all is Peyton Barber. He had another game where his numbers were just terrible. Four carries, six yards. He now has 28 carries for 47 yards this season. 16 of his carries have been for one yard or less. That's unbelievable. I understand why they cut Adrian Peterson. They want to develop Antonio Gibson. You have to wonder how Peterson would have accepted a lesser role. I get all that. The offense is more one-dimensional with Peterson in the game. I get that too. But what I know is that Barber hasn't helped. There is no chance for a consistent run game at this point. I also thought Gibson would have snapped off some more explosive plays by now. Hasn't happened like I thought. I still like him. I'm not certainly not giving up on the kid. But they do need more from the ground game, and they're not getting it. The Shades are ever played for Troy Apt today, and what it also sig- signals is that Washington still can't solve this position. I've always liked Everett for with the role he had. Good special teams player, can fill in, plays with some pop. I think Apke can be a good special teams player as well. I think it remains to be seen about his ability at safety. But man, do they lack playmakers in the defensive backfield outside of Kendall Fuller. He's always been a guy you can trust. Not perfect, but you know he'll be in the right spot. That's why they can move around in the secondary. He's prepared. He plays with his eyes well. So they can put him at safety in some spots. I don't think as a full-time role it's what you want. But in passing situations or in some packages, I like it. The problem with a full-time role is then, it, then what it comes down to is your ability to fit, fit on run and run situations and, and your angles there. That can be a tough adjustment for safe, for corners going back there which is why I like him in the limited role. But it's Fuller's approach that gives him a chance to be that versatile. I also think Landon Collins has got to pick up his play because it hasn't been acceptable for what he's getting paid, for the role he's supposed to have. That 49-yard run by Jones, it's coming because the attention is not paid to the quarterback 
Later in the game, you notice that they, the Giants tried that same play, but the zone read, Jones kept it. But that the next time, um, Collins was, was, did what he's supposed to do. He, he had the quarterback. The end had the, pit, the, end had the running back. The, see, Collins had the quarterback. Stayed with him that time, four-yard gain. First time, bites hard in the run, did what he wasn't supposed to, gives up a big play. He's given up too many. He's been involved in too many big plays allowed this season. Lastly, I know there will be heat on Dustin Hopkins because he missed another field goal. He's now 5 for 7 this season. Problem is, every miss kills this team. They're not going to find, but the other problem is they're not going to find somebody who's perfect, I don't think. But with this, with their team this season, that's what they need. Not quite sure how long the leash is with Hopkins here, but obviously the kicking game needs to be better. They needed to come away with the points after a six-minute opening drive and failed to do so because of a missed field goal. Anyway, that's all I've got. Let's get to my conversation with the voice of Washington, Bram Weinstein. I'm Tali Farhadian Weinstein. I'm a candidate for Manhattan District Attorney, and I'm the host of a new podcast called Hearing. It's devoted to in-depth conversations about building a better criminal justice system. You'll hear interviews with people like Senator Cory Booker, New Yorker writer Jai Young Fan, and civil rights leader Ben Jealous. It's a new kind of political podcast where you'll hear a candidate, me, using her prosecutorial instincts to ask the right questions and share the answers. We're calling the show Hearing because I believe that real leaders listen. It's the only way we'll carve a path to a fair and fearless future. You will find Hearing wherever you get your podcasts. Brought to you by Pushkin Industries and paid for by New Yorkers for Tali. You've heard me talking about Lone Oak Coffee for a couple months now. Let me tell you a little bit about who they are and what they're about. Lone Oak Coffee is based in the Shenandoah Valley, just a nice bunch of people who are open for business during this trying time. Just look at their website, LoneOakCoffee.com, and what do they highlight? Their core values of quality, family, transparency. They work with co-op farmers from all over the world to source their beans. They also support small farmers to find the right beans. During this pandemic, one of my saving graces has been grinding my beans from Lone Oak Coffee and taking a few minutes before the day to savor the coffee, get my mind right, put a little jazz or Frank Sinatra or Louis Armstrong on in the background, it's even better. I've enjoyed all their blends, but among my favorites, the Ethiopian Guji, love the berry flavor, the Mexican Chiapas, and their house blend. Start your day off right with Lone Oak Coffee. Visit LoneOakCoffee.com, that's L-O-N-E, O-A-K, coffee.com. Use promo code COFFEE2020 for a discount. You can thank me later. All right, Bram, well, let's start with the, the obvious call, the two-point conversion. What did you think of that? I was surprised. Um, I was really surprised. You know, it, it's like, look, I am really happy that and I'm encouraged by the win now mentality because it wasn't that long ago that we were wondering with the timeouts, you know, are they really trying to win right now? And or was that really a paramount issue? And clearly Ron Rivera with the quarterback change and everything said this quarter of the season really, really matters. And they want to try to win these games. And yes, one play won the game and they went for it. And he's been known to go for it. So it doesn't like come out of character, really, if you know him. Um, that said, the two scores that the Giants had came off of turnovers, and one was a defensive touchdown, and the defense was dominating in the second half. I got really, or at least in the fourth quarter. I, I think there's, you know, listen, hindsight's easy because it didn't convert. But going to overtime and, and taking your chances with the defense in overtime felt like, you know, the direction they were going to go. That said, they converted and they went 21-20. to 20. I'm not sure anyone's complaining other than to say, boy, that was a risky thing that you did. With a loss, it feels like all those hopes and goals that you had about chasing down the division fell on this one decision, and you don't know what would have happened in overtime had they given the defense a chance in overtime. Well, that was my thinking, too, is, and, you know, he said after the game, talking about um, on the road, you go for you go for two. Now, I also wonder if having no fans in these stadiums, if that impacts your decision-making or not, because really the only difference is that you're getting on a plane afterwards – but they did have the momentum 
on both sides of the ball at that point because the offense was moving the ball too. That's the thing that I wondered about. And is that is that kind of where – I guess that sounds like where you're at as well. Yeah, I, I was surprised. I mean, it's funny. You know, we were doing the game today. We were doing it from FedEx Field because we're still not traveling with COVID. And so we're following what's happening on TV. And even on the broadcast, they said they're like an extra point away from tying the game and, you know, probably sending it into overtime. And it took a while for the camera to then go back and to show that the offense hadn't left the field. So it took me a moment. I was surprised. I mean, like really genuinely surprised. And then unfortunately they weren't able to convert and it's another loss and it's a devastating one. And it's one that they threw all of this merit and weight on and said, we need this. And this is what we're playing for. And we're going for a win. It was a heavy risk that he took and it it didn't pay off. And um, look, I just, the one score they gave up in the second half was a, was a defensive touchdown, you know, a fumble return. I don't know how you don't trust the defense there, but you know, then again, if they had converted this, I'm not sure we're having this conversation. We would have said, boy, that's risky, but at least it worked out. Well, if if he if they convert it, we're we're back to Riverboat Ron, but they didn't convert it. And this is a team that has now lost five in a row. So that that plays into this as well. And you know, is there something to be a lot of there was a lot of talk after the game about like trying to build the mentality, you're here to win, you're here to win. Is there anything to gain? from a decision like that, or is this just an individual in a va- in a, individualized in a vacuum and like you didn't get it and this isn't necessarily about building a mentality, you just didn't win now? So I, you know, I think it's funny, like you, know, you and I have done this a long time and a lot of this stuff ends up becoming old news very quick. Like, and the timeout stuff feels like eons ago now, but that <laughs> in that vacuum, we were sitting there going, wait a minute, aren't you trying to play to win the game? Like, what's what's going on here? I mean, I know it's two scores and all, but that seems out of character to like, hey, we're trying to win now. And this one, you know, also falls into this vacuum. This is one of those times where I really do wish we had more access and we weren't in the times that we are. Because I think you really need to talk to the players and the leaders on the team about how they feel about this. You know, these decisions that are made, whether they're in this particular vacuum or this particular game, or just kind of, you know, just generally the decisions that are being made, especially in game and critical moments, the decisions that are made, how do they feel about it on or off the record for that matter? And because we don't have a lot of access to them, I don't know that we have a really good pulse in the locker room. Like once they get on a Zoom call and talk to everybody, they're in all likelihood going to say the right thing at the right time. How do they really feel about what's going on? I'd love to know the answer to all of that. I'm I'm with you there. And I think that is one thing that gets lost this season because you're usually going to have someone say, listen, I can't believe we, you know, we, that we went for it because we had this, all this momentum or the defense was doing this. We had to shut them down, but nobody really knows. But I would, like I said, if, if it works, then you're hailed as Riverboat Ron and that's how you build a nickname. And is this almost, you know, if you have this kind of mentality, you are going to fail at times in these situations. Do you just have to live with that if you want to grow? But I think, I think the other thing for fans, I'm sure, too, what's hard is, again, five losses in a row. This was an 0-5 team, and that, I think that's what makes it harder to swallow. They want to see progress. Are we seeing progress here? You know, it's funny, too. Like, last year, weren't the Dolphins um, – they were winless when they tried this, remember? Late against Washington. Yeah. They did it at against home. Washington. They tried it late. And it's funny, like, oftentimes you'll see this in a – like, let's just say it was the Baltimore game and Washington was down by one at the last second where they're these heavy underdogs against an AFC contender and you got the shot to beat them on one play. I don't think we'd be questioning it like this. You know, I think we'd be like, you know what? Like, <laughs> they took their shot, you know, at Lamar Jackson in Baltimore. Because it was an 0-5 team they were playing, there is, I think, this feeling of, wait a minute, like, why not extend the game a little bit here? You know, your defense is playing really, really well. You know, your offense moved the ball when they had to. They scored late in the game. Like, let's take our chances in overtime against the 0-5 team who keeps, by the way, if you'd watch them in previous weeks, blowing it late in the games against Dallas, right. against the Rams. Like, they had a penchant for doing the wrong thing at the end of the game as well, and you didn't put them in a position, a pressure position to do that. Um, so, you know, look, I don't know. Listen, the Dolphins did this last year where they were like, go for broke. Let's try to get a win against a team with a bad record. And it did not work out. Same, it was exact same scenario, really. Um, and so I, I don't know. Like, it's the decisions that are occurring feel very inconsistent just in general. But I do like that, like, this one was in the name of trying to win and win now. 
which feels a little different than it did about three, four weeks ago. Well, even, and even three or four weeks ago, it was always a, there was, there was always a pick your spot because he was still going for it on those fourth downs when the game was in the balance. It just felt like he just kind of, you know, late in the game, you're down by two scores. Hey, that's it. Um, so this was a more direct chance to win versus, Hey, maybe we're still in the game. You can get that, but um, it yeah. does. And some I, of the I do wonder. Too. Yeah, yeah, some of the messaging too. Like, and I saw this, and I thought this was predictable because people are going to say this. You know, the fourth and goal that Haskins was forced to try to pass a test, and they're writing, "Did Kyle Allen have to pass a test?" You know, at the end of a game and put him in a spot. You know, and and how does that weigh on a decision moving forward? Because they didn't pass that test. You know, I just I think all of it does add up to. You know, are you looking for consistency in action, consistency in messaging? And we haven't seen a lot of that, you know, six games, right. frankly. We just haven't seen a lot of that. But, you know, like I, I do go back to, you know, I, I know what the motivation was there. And it was to win a game that they felt like had they won would potentially turn a season around, whether that's realistic or not. But in the short term, it was. I mean, look at who they're playing, you know, over the next few weeks. They're playing the Cowboys who are without Dak Prescott and have a bad defense. They're playing the Giants again. They're playing the Bengals who have one win. Uh, they're playing the Lions whose two wins are against bad teams. I mean, like, you know, frankly, like they have an opportunity to compete here and turn their season around. And I guess that's why I think we're all kind of in this middle spot where I appreciate the thought, the thought behind it. And then there's another part that says, I don't know, extending the game felt like the right thing to do. Yeah, I, I'm I'm with you there. Again, though, I do wonder: Are we seeing growth from this team? Good question. I don't, I don't know. I mean, I thought Kyle Allen played pretty well. I mean, honestly, and like, and when when you ask the question, like, is the offense better? Um, listen, that that is that team that they played today is not the Rams or the Browns for that matter, or the Ravens. Um, so they should have been more effective against them. That said, I mean, but they do have a good yeah. defense. They do actually. I mean, like, I don't think people know that they were at least in yards allowed. They were a top ten defense coming in. I think they're a right. little bit better than than people think, you know. And they do have to like they brought in Blake Martinez, who is pretty good, and Peppers, who's been injured but been okay. Their defensive like Dexter Lawrence was a first round pick. He's kind of coming around. Like they're Bradbury's a good corner. Like they're better than people think. They hadn't been giving up really a ton of yardage, and so I actually thought that was a pretty good game. They had three scoring drives of ten plus plays, five six minutes off the clock. You know, like the offense functioned. It did a lot better. I still don't think they're running the ball very effectively right now. I don't know if they can. But um, and I and the one thing also that I think was a real disappointment was Sadiq Charles getting hurt two plays into the game. So we didn't even really get a look at him, you know, because I think they're hoping he's an answer for a spot on the offensive line. And now it's at least a week or two away from finding out if he can be that for them. Yeah. And, you know, you I go to the running game, too, because that those numbers jump out every week and. I felt like Antonio Gibson showed a couple of things, but just from the problem is like, what is the, there's no real offensive identity at this point. There's none. And I don't know. I agree with you. Like I don't see them becoming a really good run team with what they have right now, not to the level that I think they would need to be that effective. I mean, I just, I wonder what their confidence is in the run game in general, just in, and we talked about this a little bit last week on, on my show and, Look, Antonio Gibson's learning how to be a running back. And that's obvious, like, when you watch the games back. Like, he is clearly a playmaker now because he has to be and clearly a playmaker of the future for them. But he needs a little more time to become seasoned as an NFL running back. Like, go watch the patience that Devontae Freeman runs with. And granted, he's been doing this a, a long time. But under, you know, but he's also behind a offensive line. He's got a lot of questions right behind it. He mm -hmm. is able to kind of make yardage. He's more patient. He knows when to cut back. There's all these kind of little things that I think Gibson's going to learn over time. But we got to give him the patience for that. And they do not have what would be an effective running back behind him, like a pure running back. Gibson out of the backfield, McKissick out of the backfield, and at times running the ball a little bit today. They are dangerous weapons for them, but. Do they have someone that they believe is a bell cow, move the chains, you know, run, run the ball in between the tackles type of running back? I'm not sure they feel comfortable. And from what I've seen, like that may be, as Ron Rivera said after week one, a year away from developing, especially if it's going to be Gibson. You were a, you, you were not covering the team back when Marty was here. 
I was. No, I was here. A... No, I was there. Oh, that's right. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no, I was oh. there. Oh, yeah. Okay. So does this remind you at all of that year? That's the start. Remember how bad it was after they were 0-5 and, and it was brutal. Yep, it was 0-5 and, and then LeVar made this crazy play against, against Carolina. Carolina and turned the season around. And, you know, even today, and that's part of like, God, they scored with 30 seconds left in the game. If they walk out of there with a win, even against a bad team, I really feel like it is the start potentially of something where there's some momentum that might be built just based on who they're playing over the next month. There's an uh, there's a lot of opportunities. Like you and I both know what the hype is around Dallas showing up here, regardless of what the records are of the teams. They get the Giants again after a bye week. They get the Bengals. They get the Lions. You know, one of them's here. Like, there was a real opportunity here. And I guess the same opportunity would have existed, and they would have felt great had they won 21-20 to today. But it does feel like a real opportunity lost. And um, are they heading trending in that direction? I don't, I don't really – I don't know. You know, like, I don't think we'll know till we know. But granted, the same thing was happening early in the year. The offense was just woeful under Marty Schottenheimer. Today was clearly a much better day. They had sustained drives for the first time, multiple sustained drives. Thought Allen made some very good throws. He can throw a fade. We learned that one today. And he can do a couple things that I think maybe, you know, I think this is a fair criticism of Haskins. I I don't think they can move the pocket they want to move with him. He's not as mobile. And Allen has not only the willingness to do it, but the capability of doing it. Is he you know, have the ceiling Haskins has? No, like it's not, you know, it's not even close, but I think they can do more things with the offense with Allen there. I think you saw a little bit of it today. Yeah. And that's what I was going to ask you that we can close on that one too. So the decision to stick with Allen and and basically you're keeping both Alex or Alex Smith and Dwayne Haskins on the bench. You okay with that? Yeah, I am. I, you know, I really, I, I, this is probably not going to happen, but there's just this part of me that wants Haskins to be the backup. Like just on the, if you have to go to somebody else, if that's where you go, but that's just kind of my own personal feelings about it. Um, But without really knowing exactly internally what's going on there between the team and him, um, because that question keeps coming up when you ask people on the outside in, and I think it's a reasonable question to ask, why would he go from where he was to where he is, especially when you know the physical limitations of the backup quarterback right now, and that that backup quarterback is not, you know, the future of the team. So I, I think there's maybe should be a recalibration of that. But off of what I saw today, you know, I, I don't think you take Kylan Allen out. I mean, he made a bad mistake. They got down 329 to go on the clock with their timeouts. He walks him down the field and what should have been tie or win the game. How do you pull him out after that? <laughs> like, I don't see how you pull him out after that. Like, you roll with him next week against Dallas and you see how it goes. Dallas has a bad defense too. So there is something to watch, <laughs> but we'll see, Bram. Always. Um, we always, it always feels like this team is always on that precipice of disaster or whatever. And I don't know that there's going to be a disaster type situation. I don't think the locker room is lost or anything like that, but I think it goes back to kind of what you said earlier, our inability to be in that locker room to really have the conversations you need to find out what's really going on. And I think that. Well, let me ask you this then. Since you asked me, do you think this is like the Marty year? Do you feel that at all? Well, the, the, well, the, first of all, I think the big difference is I felt, I always felt like Marty was ahead of a, a deeper, more proven track record of success. So what I always felt like that year, like I kept remember thinking that I can't believe that a Marty shot and armor team is this bad. Cause it was just bad. It was not only bad those five games, it was bad in preseason too, if you remember. And the offense was right. so bad. This is one thing I remember, Bram. We're in the press box, and there was a single sheet of paper float drifting down from the upper deck. And somebody joked, "There goes Jimmy Ray's playbook." It was like <laughs> you know, it was it was that bad. So you know, I felt like, and then that team too, maybe in some ways was worse because they were on the verge of mutiny against that guy. If you remember, after five games, like people, mo- a lot of those players were were definitely upset. And in the end, it was really only a couple because at the end of the year, I think both Daryl Green and Bruce Smith still weren't sold on Marty, but a lot of others, most of the other guys were from what we talked to. So I think it's a different situation in that I think that when I when I'm hearing from people, sometimes secondhand, sometimes first, is that 
there's still a it's still a good vibe in the locker room. Um, and I think that with you know, I think there's some things around with the coaching staff that not everybody's gonna be pleased with. So I'm not gonna say it's all hunky dory, but um with Marty it was a mere, near mutiny. And I, you know, but I also felt like that team galvanized after that Carolina game. And you could just see something change with them, but they also had an identity. They also played very physical. And I think that's the thing that I don't see here yet is I don't know what their identity is. What, what can they, what can they fall back on? What's their, you know, what, what's their bread and butter with this team? What is it? I don't, I don't know. And I think until you find that, then no, I don't, I'm not expecting a turnaround like that at all. So, you know, I think this is going to be a slower build to back to respectability for from what people really would probably want probably so, true but i've yep. been patient for a while i will remain patient <laughs> well and that's the hard part is to keep and we've talked about this every week it feels like but asking people to remain patient as long as they have and again this this new regime is paying for the sins of the past but those sins of the past i get carried forward by the fans and i don't blame them for being upset because yeah, you want to have you want to have a level of hope and losing Haskins, taking Haskins out. If it's the right decision, I mean, I understand the decision, but what you did is you took away the hope for some fans to see a guy, can he develop? And maybe he still does. He's, he's 23 years old, but that's where I think that stings for a lot of people is where's now the hope, you know, now you have to wait to see who's the next quarterback, you know, it's you not, know just, I don't, so the, the hardest thing about today really is, just think about what happened. Like they had the ball with three plus minutes to go in a 13, 13 game. And it's a sack fumble goes the other way touchdown. And they bounced back, walked down the field and scored a touchdown on a receiver who shouldn't even been in the game because of an injury earlier in the drive. And we're talking about a loss because of a decision. And I just feel like everything would feel different. Even if they lost in overtime, I think things would feel yeah. a little bit different because that would have been probably on the defense had they lost in overtime. And I, you know, when is it terrible to have your quarterback bounce back from that drive down the field and throw a couple of clutch, clutch plays to get them into the end zone when you need them to. So I feel good about all that. And that's where the riverboat decision at the end, it unfortunately falls flat because the end result is what the end result is. It erases what happened that led up to that moment. And that's the hard part about this today, I think. Yeah, I, and I would agree with that. Now, the hard, again, the hard part with the riverboat Ron mentality is that you have to, you know, it's if you're going to be aggressive, you kind of have to embrace it in full because you can't always, you know, while I have the same thought, like you had the momentum of the game, you're going to go for it. But if you have that mentality and then it's like, well, this is who I am and who we're going to be then you, you, do you have to embrace all of it? Or is it, is because when do you pick and choose? You know what I mean? Like that's, that's the hard part with that mentality well, is that, uh, is it. Think about the first half one. I mean, fourth and nine, they punt. Tressway pins them at the one because of a, a penalty. They get a fourth and four. They go for it there. If they don't convert that giants, get the ball in good field position up 13 to three. Instead, they do go down, score a touchdown. He looks like a genius for right. doing that. So there were two massive gambling decisions that occurred at the end of halves. One that paid off in a huge way, jackpot, and the other one bust. And unfortunately, it's the second one that ended up mattering most because yeah. the final score read 20 to 19 and they kick a chip shot extra point in overtime. And I don't know what we're talking about today. Yeah. Well, what I know is this team needs a win. These fans need a win. And until that happens, we're going to get, it's going to be a lot of um, angry people and I don't blame them. You know, you want to win. So Bram, I appreciate you joining me. Yep. Is there anything more craveable than the smell of McDonald's fries? If someone's hiding an order of fries, they're never hiding it well. It takes one whiff to trigger a fry craving that will only be satisfied the McDonald's way. So stand up if you would like to taste the smell of a McDonald's fry right now. Did you just stand? Because if you did, then you earned yourself a trip to the McDonald's drive through for your own steamy carton of crispy golden goodness. Ba -da -ba -ba -ba. I used to love making all of my own spices. Now I love reaching for one of Dizzy Pig's craft seasonings. Based in Manassas, Virginia, they grind their spice combinations daily 
and it's easy to see why they've built a loyal following over the past 20 years. Dizzy Pig owner Chris Capel has won 15 championships on the Pro Barbecue Tour using only their products. And I've heard from other pitmasters on the Barbecue Tour that insist on Dizzy Pig. If it's good enough for them, it's good enough for me. Just recently, I cooked a ribeye with their cow lick seasoning. Fantastic flavor. My wife really likes the mole and the Peruvian, and the popular Dizzy Dust is truly all-purpose. And if you're cooking turkey during the holidays, you have to use their Mad Max Turkey Rub. It's seasonal, so you can buy it now until January. With 27 different blends, there is a seasoning for just about any recipe or cooking technique. Get 15% off your online order shipped in the U.S. if you use the coupon KIM15, that's K-E-I-M-15, at DizzyPigBBQ.com. That's D-I-Z-Z-Y-P-I-G-B-B-Q.com. That's it for this episode. Back to another Therapy Thursday this week. Thanks to Brand for joining me. I'll also be talking to ESPN Safety Todd Archer about the Dallas game and as well as the Cowboys' struggles this season. Misery loves company. And more fantasy football with Tyler Roman. Don't forget to support our sponsors, Lone Oak Coffee and Dizzy Pig Barbecue. And thank you for listening. Hang in there, folks. Talk to you Wednesday.